image of the international monetary system, it's right here. And 75 years to the day that the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement was signed, the team at Bancor has brought 250 delegates from all over the world, from a myriad of disciplines, not to remake or replace that image, but perhaps to enhance it, to redetermine what value is, and certainly to see if crypto and blockchain can be used as a means to make it more inclusionary. Here's a look at Bretton Woods 75. Things like the World Bank, IMF, NGOs have done a lot of good. Uh, there are other people who would disagree. <laughs> yeah, there were writers. Join me in looking at our society and our economy as they can be. And we need that now more than ever. Even former military leaders, and of course, leaders in the blockchain and crypto space to reflect upon and rethink economies of the future. 75 years ago, 700 men gathered here to design a framework for global economic cooperation that they hoped would end world wars. Economic cooperation and interdependence create peace. And that's the historical backdrop to realize the significance of this place. Just part of the reason why the team at Bancor spent the last year organizing and curating this very unique, forward-thinking, yet historically observant conference on the 75th anniversary. So we're in the gold room here at Bretton Woods, and it's where the Bretton Woods Agreement was signed. Brock, how's it feel to be here? Well, honored, privileged, I mean, his, historic. And to be able to have a conversation about the future of the monetary system 75 years later in this same space and to sit at this table, how lucky are we? It all happened here 75 years ago that really set up the post-war economic order, set up the World Bank, the IMF, the World Trade Organization, uh, the whole structure of international capital flows were really set by the way in which uh, the people here decided to sign an agreement for setting up these kind of institutions. There are alternatives that they could have picked. They could have picked uh, Bancor, which Keynes had pushed for, a one global currency. Instead, they allowed for continued national currencies and really put a privileged place for the dollar in that. One proposal that was made here was actually called Bancor, and it was made by John Keynes. He was the British Secretary of the Treasury. He suggested a supranational currency, a new currency that would be owned by no nation. He wanted this currency to be distributed essentially to all the nations in accordance with their trade balance. He thought that this would be kind of a fair way to jumpstart the post-war economic order. And the idea of having this currency for currencies is what we are like, that, that's really, really smart. That's much better than trying to create exchange pair between any two currencies. The idea of Banco was exactly to be the super national currency that will be able to connect between all the world's currencies and to be in the middle. We see currency as a tool. Um, a tool for human collaboration. Uh, and we don't see a limit on how much of this tool that we can have. The long tail is open to everyone. Um, the vision really is that uh, currency is becoming a tool for the uh, quantifying, the storing, and the moving of the value between people. And it's much more dimensional, that value, than our current monetary system really allows us to account for. That proposal really inspired us. Clear is the Amazon. We're really stuck in this low extractive value economy. And so we want to add all of the variables that today are excluded from the equation of how you value land and how you value uh, an ecosystem. And we want to put those in the equation so that then they become monetary value and that they can actually be circulated and create a bioeconomy. And trying to recalibrate both the measurement and value of different types of economic input for growth was Rian Eisler, renowned author and economist. This conference is dedicated to new thinking. And oh my gosh, is that urgently needed. We must change how we measure economic health. Not only does GDP include negatives as positives, it fails to include the huge economic value of the essential activities of the three economic sectors ignored in present thinking, the natural economy, the community, 
volunteer economy and the household economy. I mean, the things that I care about are things about uh, inclusion. How do we build economies that are more equitable? I care about sustainability, especially environmental uh, sustainability. How do we give agency to uh, people like women, minorities? And so the concept of financial inclusion and how we at least give everyone access to the same tools so that people have, call it fairness and equal opportunity, while combined with things like transparency and trust, I think are essential to the world that we want to create going forward. And things like Bank Corps and their protocol to deliver, you know, call it community currencies, I think are, are, are one of the things that if, if you're really interested in this aspect of how we can make the world a better place and how we can democratize the global financial system in a way where every human being on the planet has equal access, you know, definitely one of the rabbit holes I recommend going down. Well, my big interest is in the bottom billion, the underserved populations who aren't currently in the economy, who don't have identities, who don't have access to the economic system, who don't have um, access to electricity and the things that we take for granted. I think it's really great to have these conversations because we're creating systems that needs to work for all of us. And we're really discussing what's happening in the world. Uh, with inequity. So let the great debate begin. First up, cryptocurrency. For the first time in history, the sitting president of the United States of America tweeted about Bitcoin. With the introduction of advanced technologies like blockchain, the next 75 years are going to be transformed even more so than the last. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. To steal a quote from Albert Einstein. The world needs a trustless system that cannot be manipulated by governments, bureaucrats, or corporations. Um, so what I'm advocating for is an alternative to the system that we have today that's built on blockchain powered by crypto. We had wide-ranging arguments in favor of crypto and blockchain is an alternative to the current status quo. Blockchain gives us an opportunity to democratize this tool called money in a way that we haven't had access to um, in the past centuries. But there's a huge opportunity with the advent of cryptographically secure and validated distributed technology for us to really overturn things and I think this is the natural course. Blockchain gives us the opportunity to create a long tail of new currencies, currencies for neighborhoods, currencies for affinity groups, for teams, currencies for schools, uh, and that's really what we focus on at Bancor. I'm very interested always in uh, community currencies and how do we deliver ubiquitous financial inclusion around the planet. And so many people who are today completely outside of the market economy can potentially participate in a market economy because with digital technologies, you can get down to the scale at which they're operating. Of building uh, not just a currency, but a community of value, you're gonna see more and more uh, of this self-reinforcing cycle. You start using it in effective ways, like how do we uh, move water from being considered a commodity to being worked on as a commons? You know, that's interesting. And then blockchain is a really interesting solution for helping uh, orchestrate and govern a commons of water or a commons of air or a commons of coal. You know, how do we economize them? We may actually wind up seeing states embrace digital currency faster than people expected. Yes, and so we are starting to see it in a meaningful way where we are improving the quality of lives of people that have been very, very disenfranchised for a long time. From Treasury secretaries to central bankers. Well, it's a mix between uh, economics, environmental issues, uh, social issues, technological issues. To crypto founders. Our mission as we saw it was to present you with a diversity of perspectives. We heard from writers. The minute people use blockchain the way they could, which is as a way of, of, of reflecting the abundance of a society with plenty of people who have, who have skills and, and want to do things, uh, that's when it's a threat. We need to get outside of that old paradigm we're stuck in. We leave Bretton Woods with that fresh perspective and new challenges facing the monetary system of the next 75 years that can reshape and reconfigure along the way. And cryptocurrencies are most well positioned to be that paradigm shift. And in fact, they already are. What will the next 75 years look like? Global monetary cooperation, 
community-based currencies. According to many here, we are in the middle of that paradigm shift. This was the perfect historic setting to chart its course, and now could be time to set out on its path.